Skip the commercials and get extra long shows with behind the scenes access at patreon.com slash David C. Smalley. For more than 10 years, he's built a reputation of exploring beliefs and changing lives. And with today's division, it's time to resurrect nuance and bring back the art of conversation. He'll make you laugh. He may upset you. But most importantly, he'll make you think. From Los Angeles, California, this is David C. Smalley. Welcome to the show. Hopefully you're well rested. (laughs) Uh, You got lots of sleep. And you're ready to enjoy a nice conversation among people who disagree. Um, My guest may not actually have that same courtesy or benefit because uh, he's literally on the other side of the world. Um, He is joining me all the way from Mozambique. He is a missionary. And because of the location and sensitivity of the environment over there, we are not going to be using his name today. So please join me in welcoming the missionary in Mozambique who will not be named. Thank you so much for joining me today, man. I appreciate you coming on the show. Thank you, David. I appreciate you uh, taking the time to to let me call in and have a conversation with you. Hey, this is going to be interesting, man. I mean, uh, I I don't know that I've ever spoken with anyone in Mozambique before. (laughs) <laughs> um, so talk to me a li- talk I to me a li- most Americans don't uh, they couldn't find it on a map so <laughs> right <Yeah. laughs> so 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 do me a favor let's talk a little bit about uh, first of all why you're over there what's going on and sort of the temperature of the environment like what's happening there to make you not really want to uh, reveal your identity today yeah so we we uh, my family and I we're missionaries in uh, northern Mozambique. Um, we've been here for several years now, um, and our, our goal is to work alongside um, the established churches that are here um, to help tra- train up uh, leaders and then send them out to begin new work in, in uh, places where there are not yet churches and not yet believers. And so, uh, I mean, that's in in broad terms, that's, that's what we're doing here. Now, that takes all different kinds of forms over here from teaching English to teaching farming techniques to uh, doing Bible studies, um, all kinds of things. So um, that's basically what my family uh, and I are doing over here. Uh, Things are a little tricky right now. There is some unrest um, due to some religious extremism that's happening north of us and um, from where we are living. And uh, it is it has just gotten worse and worse over the last two years or so. Just uh, things are getting more violent. Um, the refugee problem uh, is just growing. I, in fact, today I was at a meeting um, for several hours, just talking to not just not just um, other missionaries, but other relief groups that are here trying to manage um, the flood of refugees that are coming into our town and we live in a town of about 120,000 and the estimates are that there are now 30 to 40,000 refugees that have over the last nine months flooded into our town and then and they're not just coming to our town they're going to other places and so just all the challenges that come with that people that don't have anything you know they're they left in the middle of the night they hid out in the bush for um hours and hours uh just to keep their family safe and then they somehow made it their way down to where we are at. And so they don't have anything. And so just trying to figure out what, you know, what, what can we do to to walk alongside these people that have really walked through a lot of trauma and suffering. So, so what type of, what what, what type of religious extremism is it? Are they, are they Muslims? Are they uh, somehow Uh, anti-Christian or like what's going on? No, it's, it's, I mean, they're, they, they claim to have ties to ISIS. And so that's when they started publicly, declaring that it, it raised a lot of eyebrows. Um, but there, you know, the other challenge here is the, the government and the, whether or not they're able to, to, um, handle the issue, um, from a military standpoint, from a development standpoint. Um, and so there are challenges 
not just with the group, but then in kind of the government's inability to respond to it. And so, but you know, they, it's, nobody really knows exactly what's at the bottom of it, whether it truly is religious extremism, other, you know, some people speculate that it's just, it's a response to extreme poverty and lack of opportunity that people are, are turning to, um, to violence. And that's a way to get what they want quickly. Um, there, there is a huge, uh, gas project that is, is happening up here. And, and so people, you know, there are some conspiracy theories about how that, how unrest, um, can benefit certain players within that, that, uh, that project. So anyway, there, there, there's a, on the surface, it, it appears to be a religious, religious driven, um, but nobody really knows at this point. So, um, so it looks like I just pulled up the uh, the religious demographics from Mozambique, and it seems to be largely Christian. Uh, it looks like Roman Catholic uh, is yeah, like twenty seven percent. Zionist Christian is fifteen percent. Uh, evangelical is fifteen. Mm-hmm. Anglican is one percent, and then Muslim is uh, about nineteen percent. Um, is it is it a, a people yeah. from another region, or is it just like a spin up of a small? Uh, is it like a terrorist organization? Are they are they actually causing damage, or are they just talking right now? Is it just threats? Like no, no, no. There is there is murders, beheadings. I mean, it's it's ISIS like. Um, I mean, it's, mm. there 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 are some really bad things that have happened. I mean, villages that have been burned to the ground. I mean, it's. Um, I mean, there are there are people that we are connected with that have um, i mean one one family we know of they the the wife was nine months pregnant and they're hiding out in the bush you know until these guys have had enough in their village and left and they've had to walk miles and miles to get to the the closest uh little car many of it they have these little minivans here that they transport people around and to get them down to here and and she had her baby safely down here. But I mean, it's just, it's just a, it's a rough situation. If you, wow. um, if you see kind of all the things that are going on. So, um, but yeah, there, there is, um, not to, not to go too much into to Mozambique and their history, but, um, the Portuguese landed here, uh, um, way back in the 1400, late 1400s, early 1500s declared it a, a colony of Portugal. And it was up until, um, the mid mid 20th century and then they got their freedom and then they fell into civil war. Um, but, but with that Catholic influence, the Roman Catholicism came in, but, um, it's, it's kind of like I grew up in, in Oklahoma and everybody's Baptist, but when they say they're Baptist, they mean my grandpa was a pastor. I went to VBS when I was a kid. I mean, so they're, (laughs) you know, they're nominal in their participation and here you've got a lot of people that would say they're they're catholic um but it's it just comes from years and years of the portuguese influence and they don't they don't practice it kind of at their hearts they have their traditional religion which deals with spirits deals with curses witch doctors those kinds of things and so whether you're christian roman catholic whether you're whether you're muslim i mean you've got your devout people in all of those religions but um there is many people that would identify with one of those groups kind of that's on the surface. They identify as Christian, Catholic, Muslim. Um, but below that they're, they really, um, identify with African traditional religion. So, um, so rather than if their child gets sick, rather than going to their church to have the pastor pray for the family, they go to their family, witch doctor to get a little potion or a trinket that they wrap around their, their child's wrist or their stomach to, to ward off the evil spirits that are causing the illness and so so it's a, it's a mixed bag here and so it's uh makes for uh, interesting life so <clears throat> i know your original message to me was was more about what would convince me what would what would make me a christian but i <clears throat> so I, I definitely want to get to that and i've got that pulled up if for some reason it looks like i'm forgetting that please feel free to to bring me back to that at some point. I don't want to leave this conversation without talking about that. But I, I want to talk with you about being a missionary for a moment because your your life is essentially the exact opposite of mine, right? You were trying to bring more people to Christ and I'm actively trying to talk people out of their faith. Um, and so uh, 
I like that we can have a have a discussion about our positions and about our angles um, in in a respectful way. Um, I want to I want to ask. Yeah, you a- I can appreciate I can appreciate that. That I mean, I, to me, if you if you have this guiding philosophy in your life that you believe is is true, I mean, whether I disagree with someone or not, I have a respect for those who do their best to in, in a in a respectful, kind way. Um, to try to convince other people um, to the, you know, the truth of their position. So mm-hmm. I, I think in some ways we're different and we're, we're, we're maybe playing for different teams, but I think we're both, I think we're both living by our convictions. And so <laughs> I, I respect people that even if they're playing for a team that I'm not on, I respect that they're willing to, to, to really invest their lives in proclaiming the truth that they, they uh, organize their life around. So. Yeah, no, I appreciate that. And it's not just proclaiming it. It's also having the public conversation um, because other people can benefit from hearing uh, two people have that discussion. And, yeah, absolutely. Because um, a lot of times people will you know, send me private messages on Instagram or Twitter about something they disagree with me on, and I'll give them an answer usually, and then they want to continue back and forth and debate me over instant message or something. And I'm like, listen, I... Uh, I'm, I, first of all, there's character limits, there's time limits, uh, but I don't want to do this because whatever conversation should be had needs to be had in the public sphere because other people can benefit from hearing it. So, uh, that's what I hope, you know, today's conversation is going to do. Um, so from that perspective, um, what is your belief that would happen to someone uh, spiritually or eternally who grows up in sort of an African culture um, with the witchcraft and that type of thing. They go to see their witch doctor and they live to be about, I don't know, 17, 18 years old. And then they die literally never hearing the words, Jesus Christ, never hearing about the faith, never hearing about him dying on the cross, like literally no, no, uh, it doesn't even enter their, their, their mind ever, their entire lives, and then they die. What is your belief that happens to them spiritually? Yeah, I, um, I, I, that's, that's why we've packed up our house and our family and moved over here. We, we believe that they are, they are living in danger of, of judgment, um, of eternal separation from God. And so... Um, because of that belief, um, as hard as it may be, uh, as as harsh as it may sound, um, we, that's why we've packed up our family and moved here. Is because we feel like that people are are um, living in darkness, and there are consequences to that. And the Bible seems to be pretty clear um, about those consequences. Um, now, having said that, I don't think that God is is solely limited by what what I and other missionaries can do. I think that. I think that God speaks to people. I mean, I, I think it's one of those, I think it's, there's only one way uh, to get to the Father. It's through Christ. Um, now, there's more, there's a hundred, there's thousands of ways in which someone can come to um, know Christ and understand um, what he's done on their behalf. And so, um, I mean, the simple answer is, is I, I think that they would, they would die and they would live, it, they would live separated from God. Um in judgment. So I've heard a lot of people give the opposite answer. They think that if you never hear anything about God, then he's not going to hold you accountable. And I remember a, a debate many years ago with Christopher Hitchens, where he's talking about a missionary who goes out and is, um, talking with people, and then they, they ask the missionary, what would have happened if you wouldn't have told me any of this? And they said, well, then God wouldn't hold you accountable. And then the person, the, the islander says, well, then why did you tell me? You know, uh, it's kind of, he's kind yeah, of telling yeah. a joke there, but, you know, but you have the opposite position. You, you think that if this person is born and raised in a culture in which they are never taught the gospel and never hear of Jesus, that God would still, I guess, damn them to hell for eternity for not ever hearing something that they couldn't help. That sounds really bizarre, right? So what I guess from a if I were to put my Christian hat on for a moment and remember what it was like to have the faith, I think I would still disagree with that because I would go 
that doesn't sound like a God of love or understanding or compassion at all. I mean, that is literally the opposite of compassion. You're not including anyone else's life experiences. You're just going, well, they, you know, there was a 17 year span. They were raised in an environment that didn't talk about Jesus and they never heard about Jesus and that's not my fault. So they go to hell. Um, that just seems like, um, you called it harsh. I, I would say it's completely unrealistic to think that any God that would do that would also be loving and compassionate. When, when you say that you put on your, your Christian hat, and I, 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 I'm assuming that you're saying, and you're kind of given the benefit of the doubt that God does exist, but is, is that, is that accurate to? Yeah, it's a little more than that. It's, it's me, that it's me, it's mean? me, har- well, it's me hearkening back to my Christian days and going, the, the idea that I had in my head as a, as a, by the way, a, a Baptist in Texas, uh, was very much that you know, God was a God of love. He cared about us. He would intervene sometimes to help us with things. Um, Psalms 121.7, uh, God will keep you from harm. He will watch over you. He will protect you. We're told that God loves us. You know, Jesus loves me. This I know. I mean, this is a, a constant repetitive thing mm-hmm. in Bible study that God and Jesus are, are, they have your back. There are even gospel mm-hmm. songs that I played the drums to uh, in these all black churches about God having my back and Jesus having my back and I'm going to sit at the right hand of God. And so it sounds like that God is looked at as someone who we would love and we would admire and is the source of morality and is respectable. And so when I say I put on my Christian hat, I think back to how I view God as a Christian and go, no God that I would ever believe that I ever believed in would damn someone to hell for eternal punishment and toss them into a lake of fire for something they had no control over because they didn't, they didn't know there was a gospel to seek after. Like somebody like an atheist, like me, I get it. I heard it. I believed it and then turned my back on it. That's the ultimate punishment. I understand. But for someone who never heard it for that God to throw them into the lake of fire, that doesn't sound like a God I would consider compassionate or loving at all. Mm-hmm. To, just to go back when when you say you put on your your God hat, what what is your idea of God when you when you say okay, I, there's a God that exists. What 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 characteristics qualities do you ascribe to him? Um, a God of love, a God of war, a jealous God, all knowing, omniscient, omnipresent, omnibenevolent. Um. One that knows exactly what I'm up against, one who knows what information mm-hmm. is in my head, and if there's a, I mean, let alone, you know, the eight-year-olds, the seven-year-olds, now we get into the age of accountability. Um, mm-hmm. What happens to the six-year-old who dies and is never taught about Jesus? Yeah. Uh, uh, you well, know, the, so, the reason I ask is I just, and I, I ascribed all those things, too. I mean, I, all the, the omnis and all that stuff, I... And so because of that, I, when I come to those hard questions, what, what about this? What about that? Um, I, I come with humility and say, you know what? I, I don't know. I mean, I don't, I don't know all the answers. I mean, I have my, I I have the ability to, to, to reason and to be rational. Um, but if, but if, if we put on this God hat and we say that God is all those things you just said, then I think we also have to come with humility and say, you know what? It doesn't sound right to me, but, um, and that's not the way that I would do it, but if, if God is omniscient and he knows not only all the things that we will do, but all the things that we could do, you know, the, the million different trails that our life could take based on a single decision that we make, if he knows where all those are going to end up. For me, I, I approach that God with those questions with humility um, and say, you know, <laughs> there's just not, I, I don't know how in his economy, all that works out. Um, I get that we have questions. I mean, the Bible is full of, of great men of faith who had questions and they didn't understand why God, um, did what he did, what he did. They didn't understand the why of it. Um, and so I think there's, you know, there is a place in our faith for having questions, having complaints. But for me, when I, when I bring those to God, I do it with, uh, a humility that recognizes that that God is omniscient and I and God is all powerful and God created it all. 
Um, and so I, I get your questions and to say, well, it doesn't seem like God is fair. It doesn't it seems like he is he's e- evil? Um, I get that. I mean, that's 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 a that's a natural response. But I would say that in my humility, recognizing that I am n- not those things, I, I have I bear the image of God in some ways, but I am not the. I have some knowledge. I don't have all knowledge. I have some power. I don't have all power. And so, um, you know, where I, as where we may come to those same questions, I mean, I, I don't think there's any question like that that I haven't asked myself. And I'll tell you, I, I mean, I, I see suffering over here. I mean, Mozambique is one of the 10 poorest countries in the world. Um, they had two cyclones last year, first time they've ever had two cyclones in a, in a single year. Um, and the devastation is just terrible. And I think about all the people that uh, have died and suffered. And, and so, I, I don't think there's probably any question that um, that that the skeptic has asked about why do things play out this way um, that I haven't asked. But as I ask those questions, I ask I, I do so with humility, saying, "You know what, God, I I don't know," um, and so I, I I come in humility, just trusting um, in in this God that I, I believe in, this God that is omniscient and all those different things. And I know that probably sounds like a cop out, but um, I just think I, for me, I think like when you say you put your your God hat on, I mean, I think to I don't think you can kind of put it off and on. I think you have. I mean, if you're going to say that God is omniscient and He's all powerful and that He created everything, that He spoke all things into existence, then I don't think that the, the, the you will come to Him. And say, well, I don't understand you, therefore you don't exist, or you're evil because I don't understand how you work in these situations. I just don't think you can kind of put that hat on, like we put a hat, you know a hat on. <laughs> I think it's you have to embrace all of who God is if you're going to say I acknowledge that God exists. I don't think you can say, well, God exists, but He's not. He doesn't do things the way that I would. Therefore, He's not worthy of my worship. Um, no, I understand that. So, so let me address though. There was a lot there. Um, so God gave you the ability to reason and logic, right? Mm-hmm. He, he gave you yeah, intelligence. Yeah. He gave you the ability to learn how to read and, uh, and to understand reality. So if, if there was a Bible verse in there that said that God came down to earth and as he was walking, he tripped over a rock and then a few steps later, he bumped into a wall. Would that align with what you know about God? Uh, I'm trying to. Let me, are, if if there was a verse that said that he tripped and bumped into a wall, would that align with what I know about God? Right. Um, <laughs> if if it was talking about God um, incarnate, Jesus. I wouldn't have a problem with that. I mean, I don't, I, if if there's a verse you're talking about, I, I don't know of a verse. No, no, no. Or, this isn't. A, I'm not trying to trap you about, but, <laughs> about a secret verse. Say, like, just, no, no, no. I'm saying God Himself, verse, God. Yes, or something. No, no, no. The actual God, God Himself coming, not not yeah. not Jesus, but God is on Earth. Remember how I said He came to the Garden of Eden and He spoke with Adam and Eve. So God can come to Earth without being. Like, I mean, Jacob wrestled with God, right? He didn't say he wrestled with Jesus. Mm, yeah. So yeah. so this idea yeah, that yeah. God can come to earth and, and to interact with humans is perfectly acceptable without invoking Jesus. So if God himself came to earth and the Bible verse said that he tripped over a rock and then a few steps later bumped into a wall, would you believe that? Or would you say, hold on, if God is you know, all-knowing and created everything, why would he not know the rock was there? How could he bump into a wall? He sounds fallible. That's contradictory to the very nature of God. So would you look at that Bible verse and say there must be something wrong? Or do you just set that aside and try not to think about it? Like, how would you make sense of a verse? And I want to be clear, that verse is not in the Bible. I'm not, I'm yeah. not saying that it is. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not speaking code to trick you and say, aha, we'll open Exodus 3, buddy. Yeah. Like, that's not, that's not yeah. my plan at all. I'm saying that if, if it yeah. said that, would you believe it because it's in the Bible, or would you logically think through what you know about the nature of God and say that there must be a problem with this verse? Well, I, yeah, I mean, I think, I, I, I think it could be both. I mean, I think you, if I just read that verse, I mean, um, I, mean I, I, think it's, I think it's dangerous just to, to read any verse and make any kind of doctrine on a single verse 
without hermeneutical studies, without, you know, um, comparing it to other texts. And so, I, I mean, I, <laughs> I don't know. I think if, if that verse existed, um, I would read it. I would have to study it, um, look at the context, and then potentially um, accept it. I mean, I, I don't know. <laughs> I'm not – sorry, I'm, I'm just – I'm not following – I understand. The line of thought here, as far as it, okay, so 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 the line of thought is so the line of thought is whenever you say I can't put my Christian hat on and then um, say I don't understand you, therefore you don't exist. I, I assure you, that's not a single atheist that has ever existed held that position. That that is not the position of of atheists or humanists in the slightest. Um, that would be absurd for someone to go. I don't understand. Uh, the way brain surgery works. Therefore, brain surgery doesn't exist. I mean, that's just asinine. Well, but, I'm, so, but you're, well, I think you're, aren't, wouldn't you say that you think that the problem of evil is a, is a huge argument against the existence of God, or at least the existence of a good God? Well, to be fair, it's not, and, and I'm glad you brought that up, because it's not that I don't understand or I'm saying I wouldn't behave that way, therefore you don't exist. It's that yeah. it's that the principles that we learn about God in the Bible and the principles that Christians tend to believe about God, meaning that he is loving and compassionate and that humans are his special creatures and that we are this amazing creation of his, is contradictory with how he treats us oftentimes in the Bible and in reality. So it's not that I wouldn't work that way. Therefore, I don't, uh, therefore I don't believe in you or, uh, I don't understand it. Therefore you don't exist. Neither of those are the position. The position is this, this behavior is inconsistent with the characteristics we've been taught in the Bible. So it's, it would be like, um, it would be like learning the biography of a serial killer and you're going, oh yeah, well he killed his, you know, he killed squirrels and skinned them when he was seven years old. And then he killed three neighbor's dogs when he was 12. And then he, you know, by the time he was 16, he had killed his first two people. And then by the age 47, he was just murder, 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 death, death, kill. And then you find out, you know, and then someone tells you a story and goes, um, I actually heard he volunteered at the local homeless shelter and opened, um, uh, two schools in, in Nicaragua and uh, donated blood every week, you'd be like, hold on, this guy did? Right? It would make you pause to go, someone who seemed to be completely sociopathic and and a, be on a murderous rampage from the time of, you know, eight to ten years old, was the same person who gave blood and helped build schools and, you know, volunteered at homeless shelters? Your brain would have to pause. You would have to pause there. You wouldn't just believe whatever that person told you. Well, why? Because it doesn't fall in line with the character of that person. So you're, I'm judging God based off of what I've learned about God in the Bible and what people believe about God. Now, uh, from the atheist perspective, I have to say a lot of times what happens in the Bible is God says one thing and then does the literal exact opposite. He will say, like, thou shalt not kill. And then he will literally kill people by the hundreds or the thousands or lay waste to an entire village. Um, statistically, we know there's got to be some good people in there, but he's just killing people because he's God. Sometimes it's a show of power. And if you ever question God or say, what's going on? You know, I know you know the verse. Where were you when I put the stars in the sky? Where, where were you? Like, I, I did all this. You weren't here. It's almost like a, an ego boost of like, boy, do you know who you're talking to? Like situation. So I want to yeah. be clear that I'm, whenever I say I'm making a judgment call on that, it's that if you tell me God loves me and you tell me that God watches over me and you tell me that God will keep me and my people safe, but then you tell me that he's literally flooding the entire earth and regrets making human beings, how do those two go together? So the the problem for atheists is there are multiple contradictory statements in the Bible regarding God's um, character. They say he's a person, he's a God of love, but there aren't a lot of acts of love from God in the Bible. There are a handful, 
But there are far more plagues and and destructions and mass killings and rampages and this sort of tyrannical overlord that's sort of dominating humanity as opposed to being loving and kind and compassionate. Do you, um, I was curious about what you think about this. Like if suppose um, I was trying to explain algebra to you or you were trying to explain it to me um, and you're trying to make sense of it for me. I'm trying to learn it, but I'm, I reject the single truth that one plus one equals two. Um, do you think that I would ever be able to understand algebra? Well, that's, if, if that... I didn't, if I didn't accept that, that simple truth that one plus one equals two, if I said no, it equals three. No. It wouldn't, it wouldn't make sense. Right. Yeah. And I mean, that, and I mean, the reason I, I asked that is because I've, my thought is that if, if you come into these kind of conversations from the, you know, f- from where, wherever, um, without understanding these foundational truths that, that I believe are clearly revealed in, in scripture, um, concerning the nature of God, concerning his, his purpose for creation, um, if you don't understand those, then you're never going to understand when he tells, uh, when he tells uh, Joshua and the Israelites to wipe out, you know, the, um, the, the people in Canaan. Um, you just, you, and you can't just step into that and say, okay, I accept that. I mean, it's, it's well, unless well, me, you fully embrace sorry. that, that foundational well, truth, you're just, it's never going to make sense. And so when people step into that conversation from, a different perspective and say, well, I'll grant you that he exists, but then he does this, this, and this. I just, I don't think, I don't think you can, until that foundation is laid and we're playing on the same field to talk about, you know, what he did did to the Midianites. I just, I don't think we'll ever get anywhere because it, I understand it just, it's not going to make sense. Well, well, hold on. Okay. Let me, let me, let me stop you there because I think your analogy is completely backwards. I agree with you that if you don't accept one plus one as a foundational truth, you're never going to understand algebra. That, of course. But if your analogy that one plus one in your analogy is equivalent to or is somehow analogous to um, me accepting that God created all of us, I say that's – then you're using, you're using top-down logic. You've started with your answer and you're working backwards. I think a more accurate way to say one plus one – or yeah, one plus one equals two and that's how we can start learning algebra – I would say the equivalent to that or what would be analogous is that when you love people, you don't set them on fire. That's a basic understanding of love. When you love someone, you do not set them on fire. That is a basic fundamental truth. If you want to compare one plus one to anything in humanities, that would be an equal comparison. And when we work from the bottom, the fundamental, the foundation, and work upwards – that's when you get into atheism because when you start so the, when you start with the principle sorry. that when you love somebody you don't set them on fire or when you love someone you don't drown them and then work up from there you're going to get to the top and go how does god love us again so you you would say that the foundation is love and not not setting people on fire and then that based on that foundation everything that you read about script about God and scripture would be, would fall apart because, because that foundation is, um, it's clear that he, he acts in, in opposition to that foundational truth that love is. I would say that God, that, am, I, am I, am I understanding you're right? P- pretty close. I, I would, I would, I would summarize it by saying, I think God acts in ways that are morally, uh, contradictory to the way he encourages us to behave to one another. So he gives us morality, he tells us to love our neighbor, and then he drowns the entire community. He tells us to love your neighbor as yourself, and then tells us to kill people who are homosexuals in Leviticus 2013. Well, what if they're my neighbor and I love them? So I'm supposed to love my neighbor, but I'm also supposed to kill them if they break a law that you don't like. If he if they work on the Sabbath and walk around and pick up sticks to kindle a fire for their family, then I should bury them up to their neck and throw rocks at their face until they die. But you've told me to love them. It's the contradictory nature of 
you're telling me to love people. You're telling me to love humanity, but you don't. You turned Lot's wife into a pillar of salt for turning around and looking behind her. I mean, how does that punishment fit that crime? What, what damage does that do to Lot? What damage, is, what damage does that do to the other people who love her, to her daughters? I mean, th- th- this, is the, this is the nature that I'm talking about, is that if, you were to, if, if I were to tell you just the properties of God that you believe in, and I would say just write those down. Okay, he's loving, he's compassionate, he's all-powerful, he's the source of morality, he's omnibenevolent, and you list all of those things. And then, I, and then you didn't know anything about the Bible. I would say this is the, these are the principles of God. And then I were to tell you, and now I want you to write me some stories that you think God would have done. And you would no doubt recite stories of God saving people and rescuing people and helping people get better and being understanding and being compassionate and loving, showing us the love that he told us to have for one another. And instead, when we read the book about him, we find this wrathful vengeance of attacks and 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 a tyrannical overlord that is just laying waste to in, entire villages and sometimes the entire planet. So yeah, one plus one equals uh, two. And that's a foundation of understanding algebra if you're going to work from the bottom up. And if you love people, you don't hold them underwater until they die. If you love people, you don't throw them into a lake of fire. Let's start with that and see if you can get to the top and see if you can ever understand how God does not really love us. We are expendable. We are sinners. We are disgusting in the eyes of God. We're all born broken. and We have to sort of get on this impossible race to perfection before we die, or we're going to be thrown into a lake of fire. Anybody who sets those rules up for humanity does not love humanity because we are definitely set up to fail and the punishment is horrendous. That was just a quick summary. If if I could, yeah, (laughs) (laughs) gives me a chance to catch my breath. Um, To go back to this idea of love being a foundational principle. um, And I, I, I'll probably preface what I'm going to say by saying that, I, I get it. You can be an atheist and be a moral person. You can contribute to society. There, we. I know some people that are here that are have values, political views, completely opposite of me, and they're given their life to live in a in a place, and it doesn't have anything to do with faith in a God. And so, I preface that preface what I'm about to say by saying that that I because I, I, I know sometimes um, a person that's an atheist, if you start to talk about morality, they're you know they can be offended by you saying because you're implying that they're not moral Mm -hmm. if they're not, if they're not a, if they don't believe in God, I I think you can be moral. I think you can recognize morality, but I'm curious about how you come to understand love as being a foundational principle that then you can take that and overlay it over the the picture of God um, in scripture, how, how did you come to know that that's like kind of the bedrock uh, where, because you said mine is a top-down logic. I, I would argue that that love is kind of the bedrock without anything else is maybe not the top, but it's not, I don't think it's the bedrock. I don't think you hit the bottom um, by just saying that love and, you know, we have to act in ways that are loving. I don't know that that's the bedrock because what what's the authority behind that what makes what makes love the bedrock um for you because it's the basis of how we treat people around us if someone is a sociopath and has no care at all for the suffering of other human beings they will definitely act in that way they will have parties at six o'clock in the morning they will play their music loud they will scream all hours of the night they might just kick in my door and stab me to death because they're bored. They may have no sense whatsoever (laughs) for, for human suffering, right? So Mm -hmm. love for humanity is, I believe, uh, is an evolutionary adaptation for living as a social creature. You develop compassion, you develop guilt, because when you're not acting in a way that's expected of the creatures around you, you get this feeling of, I'm not being accepted, I better stop doing this thing, right? Um, so it yeah. allows societies yeah. to, to, to grow and to be stronger, because ultimately we're safer when we're together. 
But when one of yeah. us starts to stab all the other ones in the face, we inherently know that is a bad thing. We know that that causes harm. We, and I'm, I'm glad you pointed out that one doesn't need religion in order to act morally. Uh, people can recognize immoral behaviors because they know what it means to cause harm to people. And so that, the reason I put love as a foundational truth is because um, that, dictate, that dictates the behaviors of the person in question. And so to say that God loves us and then to look in the Bible as to how he treats us is a massive contradiction in my perspective. And this all goes back to my original question of, I don't understand how, like you obviously love and care for human beings and you're, and you're, you're uh, dedicating your life uh, to the betterment of humanity as you see it, which is commendable. But what I don't understand about you is how someone so loving and caring as a human being can literally worship a God who would burn that, who would burn that other person for eternity over something they never heard about. That sounds like a contradiction in, contradiction in itself that you would even admire a God who would burn this person for eternity when they had no say in the matter because they just never heard the gospel. That's what's perplexing to me. And that's why I put love as the foundation of, of humanism. You said that love, that's it's part of the evolutionary process that I hear you say. Sure, yeah. Compa- like that, it's, compassion. It's coming out of that. Yeah. So, um, like, and it's a question that, that I've often had. Like, so when you, would you say that love is, to love someone is intrinsically right or pragmatically right and the opposite you talked about a guy stabbing somebody in the eyes you know is that when, when you you would say that's wrong would you say that's wrong like it's inherently wrong or it's pragmatically wrong because if we have a bunch of people going around stabbing people in the eye we're going to wipe each other out sooner or later like when 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 atheists say that something is wrong i i'm curious about what what do they mean by wrong like because to me there's the difference between saying something is pragmatically wrong and something is inherently wrong. Yeah. So this question could open us up to the next five hours of talking about morality. Um, but I think <laughs> uh, it, it, so, so I'm a little unique in this position. Well, that's where I think you have to start before you have to, before you can start to talk about God and, you know, if he's flooding the earth, I think you do have to have a, a very firm understanding Oh, and I do. Some footing on no, what, I get what is morality. And I'm I not get saying it. you're done. I'm just saying that's why I'm asking that question. Yeah, no, I, I know. But it, this your position. No, I get it. This could just take us into another uh, discussion. So uh, I guess I, I kind of ended my last comment to you on a question, and I didn't really get an answer to that. So before I tell you all of that, if you don't mind, could you just true up for me real quick um, my concern? Because I, I will, and, and I just made a note about uh, morality, and I'm going to explain that to you, I promise. Um, yeah. about about it being wrong because I, I do have a, a little bit of a lengthy explanation there, but I do you understand that from my perspective, or, or I guess can you yeah can absolutely. you acknowledge that I don't understand how someone so loving and caring for humanity as yourself could literally bow at the feet and worship a god who would set that person on fire if you don't reach them and tell them about the gospel? Mm-hmm. Like yeah, you're you're, no, you're I, literally I saving them I, like. I, I, like I you're, think you're that's not a very fair question. Well, because you're not, if you think about it, you're not saving them from Satan. You're saving them from God. Because Satan's not making the decision here. You're basically saying, hey, I, I love my boss. He's amazing. But if you don't accept this gift that he provided, he is going to torture you for billions of years. So please accept this so that my boss won't torture you. And then you turn to your boss and say, I love you, and you gave me my morality. How did that thing give you morality when you love this person clearly more than your boss does, who was willing to torture them for ignorance? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I don't know if you want to be. I, I can, again, I completely understand that, that, that position and why someone who might come at it from, from that that position. Um, but I, I think that it's for me, the, the God that I believe in is, um, 
when I don't understand something that he has done in scripture, um, I defer to his all knowledge, all wisdom, all power, the fact that he created it all. I mean, in the same way that I, if I go to a doctor and he says, you know, I'm going to take this scalpel and I'm going to cut open your chest and I'm going to take your heart out and I'm going to put a new one in, you know, I understand, you know, I may not understand everything that's going on, but I'm going to defer to his, his knowledge, his ability. And I get it. That's not a good, I mean, all these analogies, anytime we try to make an analogy between anything on earth and this God that I claim to believe in, it, it breaks down at some point. But I think we all in different ways, we, we give other people the benefit of the doubt. I would say that I do that with God, that because of, because of who I see in scripture, yes, I see the, I see the God that, that, um, killed people with a flood. I, I see the God who, um, allowed Joseph to, to languish in a prison for years and years. I mean, I see the God who allowed women and children to be, to be killed, um, as the Israelites went into the promised land. I mean, I, I see all that. And I, and I, and I think I can say with integrity, I don't live in denial. I don't, I don't hide from those passages. When I, when I was a pastor, I mean, we speak on those and we, we try to make sense of them, but there is a part of me that again, because who I believe God to be, I approach with humility and I defer to uh, his knowledge and his wisdom in the same way that I defer to the mechanic that works on my car or the doctor that may operate on me someday. Um, well, I don't think, I don't think you would though. And let me, let me challenge that briefly because anybody who's going to go through heart surgery, many people get second opinions. Many people go uh, mm -hmm. research and see if what their doctor said is right. I think most people do. Some people yeah. will Google what the doctor's saying literally in front of the doctor's face in the doctor's office. <laughs> because if I go, if yeah. I go and I say it, it all depends on what's at risk, right? If if the yeah. if the yeah. if the yeah. mechanic is changing your oil and he pops out and says, "Hey, you need an oil filter. It's only going to be six bucks," or you, "Hey, you need a new air filter. It's going to be nine dollars. Can I throw one in for you?" You're like, "Yeah, sure." But if he comes out and says, "You need a super special." air filter and it's going to be $876. <laughs> you're not yeah. going to defer to him. I've been to that. Yeah. You, you, I've been you, to that yeah, before. me too. We, we've probably been to the same guy. <laughs> and so, yeah, you don't defer to him. You go, you know what? Put my car back together. I'll drive it down the road. If the next three yeah. people tell me I need that yeah. special thing, then maybe I'll acknowledge it. So I don't think you would actually defer. And if the doctor tells you, Hey, take, take this, uh, amoxicillin. And if it doesn't clear up in six or seven days, come back. Awesome. Um, that's, I think, believable. You defer to that. But if the doctor tells you, if you don't take this one pill, you're going to explode. You're like, uh, all right, I'm going to go see a different doctor because you're insane. Right. So yeah. de depending on the, yeah. the risk of what the person is, is telling you to do now, I would say that, <laughs> uh, being thrown into a lake of fire for all of eternity is a bigger risk than an $876 air filter. So this type of this type of outrageous extreme claim to me requires more evidence that God is a good God, because from everything I've seen, but if, I don't even even if even if you could prove to me that God does exist and we're going to get into that in a little bit. If that is the God that you're worshiping, I don't believe he would be worthy of my worship because of how he treats humanity. Mm -hmm. I don't think he. Yeah. yeah, I don't know. I and again from I think from a certain perspective, I and I, I get that the, the deferring go and getting a second opinion, and I I guess I would follow up and say in my with God, it, I mean I've I've been a believer now for oh gosh thirty something years, and I've gone to Bible University and seminary, and um, and so it's not like I took the first pastor that I ever heard and just that you know yeah. he gave me one verse and i said okay that's that's what i'm going to believe i mean it's there's been years of wrestling with scripture and and i mean that's part of the reason why i you and i are communicating because i feel like any any person with a robust faith should be willing to sit down with people who believe the exact opposite and have conversations and if you can't uh that shows some some weaknesses in your faith and so i would say that i i have gotten the second opinions i mean in the sense that I've studied these things. I've, I've studied Greek. I've studied Hebrew. I've studied hermeneutics. I've, um, I've um, wrestled with scripture. I mean, this morning I was up at five in the morning reading my Bible, marking it up and stuff. And so, 
Um, I, I agree completely. I mean, I've, I've never had surgery, but I imagine when I do, I'll be the, I'll be the, the guy in the office Googling, you know, whatever surgery right. I'm having to make sure this doctor's not a quack or whatever. But yeah, exactly. Um, so what if God's a quack? But again, I, I, let's think about that. What if God's a quack? <laughs> Well, 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 listen, it's, well, it's entirely it's possible. Risk. I mean, I know it sounds funny you know, coming out of my mouth, uh, of course, but it, it's entirely possible once we acknowledge that it's possible for God to exist and for Satan to exist. Now we know that there are powerful deities uh, who can be evil. It is entirely possible that God is terrible. He's evil and he's willing to torture people who have never heard of him. And you feel inspired and not just inspired, but obligated, obviously, to go save those people from the God you worship. There's a there's a funny meme that atheists pass around all the time, so I doubt you've seen it. But it's Jesus knocking on a guy's door and he's like, let me in. And and the guy's like, no. And Jesus knocks again and goes, let me in or else. And the guy yells out, yeah, or else what? He goes, well. I just need to save you. And the guy's like, save me from what? And Jesus says, from what I'll do to you if you don't let me in. Now that's, yeah. <laughs> it's a joke, but it's, it's pretty yeah. spot on for the Bible. And that's, you know, as a missionary, if, if you're in, listen, this is going to sound weird, but if your, if your uh, entire purpose was, hey guys, listen, everybody in Mozambique, I need to save you. Because God is extremely evil and terrifying. And if you don't accept Jesus in your heart, he's going to wrathfully torture you for all of eternity. You will be thrown into a lake of fire and suffer in agonizing, screaming pain for all of the rest of existence. And he's a terrible guy. So I want to save you from him. That sounds like you're doing something good because you're saving people <laughs> from the monster. But then you turn and praise that monster as being holy and loving. And I'm going, how though? So how do you see God yeah. as loving when he would be willing to torture people who've never heard of him? I think that, um, again, I mean, I, I, I just don't know if, being able to explain that um, in a way that's going to make sense to to someone who doesn't fully embrace all that God is, because I I, I can't explain all of it, and I I fully I fully admit that that I, I can't explain how it all works together. But I I again I defer to um, what I I see in Scripture, the character of God that I see in Scripture, and I know you're gonna say, well, but all these stories they show, they show <laughs> yeah, the Bible may talk about God being love, but you turn a few pages and there you see God wiping out women and children. Um, but again, I I defer to um, the God who created everything, and um, to me, I I mean, I, the question that I have is, even if if God were this evil, vindictive person, does that make him any less God? Yes. Yes, absolutely. I mean, does, I yes. mean his existence is based upon... I mean, I'm, I, I want to be clear. I'm, I, don't, I think that his character and his existence are, are wrapped up in, in each other. I mean, I don't, I don't think he can be God without being good and without being holy and without being... Um, it, it makes him less All worthy. Powerful, those things. It, it makes him less worthy of worship. He he could be extremely powerful, but yeah. but if my options are to go to hell or to terrifyingly go to heaven with him and be scared at the right hand of God that he's going to smite me at any moment, I, I don't understand how either one of those seems like a happy place for eternity. So sure. I mean, look, yeah. if, if, if I was trying to get you to loan me money and I said, no, to, to, I'm going to pay you back. And then you checked my credit and I, I had the lowest possible credit score. I don't know what that may be. 350, 400. If my credit was just basically non-existent and you're like, you're like, dude, you've never paid anybody back ever. I'm like, yeah, but I'm, yeah. I'm telling you to believe me. You wouldn't believe me because I've, I've shown you who yeah. I was. I've shown you my character. 
right? And and when 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 you talk about the, I'm sorry. Well, I mean, I want to just wrap it up with this. Maya Angelou said, uh, "When someone shows you who they are, believe them the first time." Right, mm-hmm. and and that's what I want to get yeah. across here is God is saying that He's good. God is saying that He loves us, but He sure doesn't act that way. So if if your neighbor is telling you, uh, "No, I, mean, I totally," re-, if your neighbor's going, "No, I totally respect you," you're like, "All right, cool." And then the next morning you wake up and He's thrown all of His trash into your yard. Do you look at your yard and go, "Oh, He must have a reason for that because He said He respects me"? No, you're going to go out there and go, "Hey, no. what you're doing is not in line with what you said." Do you respect me or not? Get your trash off my lawn, and you're going to have an issue with it. But for some reason, when God says he loves you and then dumps trash in your lawn, you go, I must be the problem. I must be broken. I must not be smart enough to understand how this garbage all over my yard means he respects me. I'm just not smart enough. I'm too stupid to understand that trash in my lawn equals love. I'll figure it out when I die. That doesn't make sense to me. I I mean, again, I I recognize how analogies – break down but I, I mean to to a one-year-old baby um a mom takes them in to get vaccines like um th- there's no way that that one-year-old can understand the science and the reasoning behind um what that mom is is doing mm-hmm. um and in that moment they may f- i mean they may feel like their their mom is a tyrant and an abuser and um and so I, I think that there's, again, analogies break down, but um, I think the understanding between us and God is much further than the understanding. There's a greater chasm between our understanding and his than a parent and a child. Um, and so I, again, I mean, I, <laughs> I don't mean to keep going back to it, but I defer. I, I, I recognize my inability to understand all the things of God um, and and so I continue. To, that doesn't mean that I just set those passages aside. I never preach on them, never teach on them. It means I continue to wrestle with them. Um, but I, I still defer to this God who is all powerful, who spoke things into existence. And really, that I mean to me, I, I, th- I think the most consequential consequential verse in all of scripture is Genesis 1 1 that if you know he created everything then everything else um, has to be filtered through that that idea that God spoke creation to existence Um, so if that verse is true that that really affects everything else that I that I believe and so I'm not sure like I I guess you're saying that there's if he if God does exist and I go tell people, then those people now are guilty of, they're in danger of being judged because they didn't know. Um, but I, I think what I would say from your side, if all this stuff is for not, if, if uh, he doesn't exist and I'm, you know, I'm over here sweating on these bumpy roads rather than being able to eat Chick-fil-A or something in the States, um, that stinks. But I haven't lost a whole lot. Um, I don't, I don't see that there is, uh, I mean, it's, it's the whole Pascal's wager. Yeah. I was going to say that. I I think you have lost a whole lot though. I think you have. I think that um, personally that a life of humanism and freedom is far more rewarding than a life serving a God that you're terrified of. And there, it's no secret that Christians fear God. And I think it's abusive. I think you're in an abusive relationship with God and that he has you out here doing his work and sweating and sacrificing uh, ultimately, ultimately because you fear um, punishment for yourself and others. And if you were instead a humanist, you could be here in the States making a massive difference in people's lives or over there in Mozambique making a massive difference in people's lives in some way that is, like you said, your atheist friends are doing there in Mozambique that are sacrificing and that are giving and dedicating their their lives to the betterment of humanity there. Um, But without that intrinsic fear 
that Christians have, that this is all ultimately being fueled by trying to avoid being set on fire by the God who you think loves you. Like that to me is just mentally and emotionally abusive. And it's, it's, um, it's almost like Stockholm syndrome. Like you're in a relationship with someone very powerful and strong who is constantly, you're constantly under the state of duress and in a threatening situation. And that motivates and drives you. And I think that, I think that's fear and I think it's anxiety driven. And I just think, Humanists who do what they do because they love humanity as opposed to fearing God are far happier. Well, I, I mean, I, I think that I, I don't know um, what all you remember from your, your days in the church, but the, the idea that I am here some try, you know, somehow trying to merit God's favor in order to secure this afterlife, um, that, that's a... Uh, that's that's not the way the gospel works, and that's a that's a misunderstanding. That's what differentiates Christianity from every other religion. Mm-hmm. That I I I believe that God transformed my life when I was a child, um, and since that time I've been secure in Him. And as I got older, I realized that all that that meant for me, all that He did, um, in order for him to secure that salvation for me, um, that my heart is filled with gratitude. I, I am not here out of fear. I don't, I don't feel like I'm going to get like to the head of the line. I mean, in the Baptist church, like you're a, you're like, um, Brad Pitt in the Baptist church. If you're a missionary, especially in Africa, like you're a celebrity, like, you know, churches want you to come and tell these stories about, you know, you know, living in Africa. Um, you're put on a pedestal, but I, I don't see myself like that in any way. I don't see myself as getting to the head of the line at the pearly gates or whatever. Like God, I, God's got a special place in heaven. I am, I'm going to make it by the skin of my teeth. And, well, that's not the right way to say it. I'm going to make it because of God's grace in, in my life through Jesus Christ. And I am here as an, as a act of gratitude to him. Um, there, there is no fear. I mean, I, you know, David, I'm, I sleep with um, the threat. I mean, we have a bag packed in our kitchen, a to-go bag, that if we get a call that the, this group has gotten a certain number of kilometers outside of our, village, our, our town, that we're supposed to get in our car and get on the one main road out of town, get south. Um, but I sleep well at night. I don't, I don't live in fear. I don't live in anxiety. Um, I, I feel like that what I'm doing is the least that I can do um, and I, I mean, I appreciate those that are here that serve simply for their love of humanity. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I would say that, you know, there, there are probably Christians that serve out of fear of hell. Um, but I would say that there are people on the other side of that, um, that serve out of selfish reasons. It's they're helping people, but by helping people, they really, they, they feel good about themselves. Um, so I think, and that's, so it's not. It's not clearly a. Um, they're not just doing it because they love people. They they love what they receive from. I'm not saying that's everybody. I mean, I'm not saying that's the people that I work with here. But mm-hmm. I, I'm saying, yeah, you've got extremes on both sides, or people might serve with the right motivation. But I would say that I can tell you with integrity, I'm here because God has done a work in my heart, and um, I've experienced that, and I believe it to be true, and therefore I want to give my life to to tell other people. Now, if it's if it's all for naught, yeah, I, I'm going to miss a lot of. Chick-fil-A sandwiches and a lot of, you know, um, time under air conditioners. But I don't know that I've, I've lost a whole lot, but I, I don't live that way. I don't live like in this gamble, like, well, if it's true, then great. If it's not, I haven't lost anything. I don't mm-hmm. live that way. I believe it's true with all my heart. Um, and that's why I moved my five kids over to, to, to Africa. Um, because I believe it to be true and I believe it'd be the best way that I can live my life. Um, you know, I, I'm sure you're familiar with Romans 12, 1, that we're to offer our bodies as a living sacrifice, mm-hmm. you know, so I, I feel like this is the least I can do. No, and, and I, <clears throat> I certainly didn't mean to imply that you were only doing it to get favor. I hope you don't think that. Uh, that's not at all what, what I was no, thinking. No, yeah, I just wanted to clarify. That, yeah, no, I, I appreciate yeah, but, it. But it, ultimately, I think you're you're worried about those people being tortured by God, right? You're worried about them being thrown into the lake of fire if they don't hear the gospel. So you're, you're kind of saving them from yeah. him. 
I, I'm saving them from the consequence of their. Or, well, I say I'm not. I'm not saving them from anything. <laughs> I'm. Uh, I'm a. I'm a beggar trying to point other people to where I found bread. Like I mean, that's. I'm not. I'm not doing the work. I just. I. By God's grace, I. I came across it, and so I want to. I want to share that with other people. Um, but yeah, there. I mean, there is this urgency. I mean, when these cyclones hit, when people are coming flooding into our town with all these stories. I mean, there's definitely this sense of urgency. Now it's, it's, um, it's, it's the sense of urgency that they are going to be judged, um, according to their sin. And so, um, and so, yeah, I, I, I think what better thing could I do if, if we have 70 years here and an infinite number of years in the life beyond, what better way to, invest my life um, here than to, to do all that I can to, to point other people to where the bread is. And so, um, but, but I get it. I, I, I know, I, I mean, I'm, I'm sorry if I, it sounds like a cop out. I just, it's to me, it's like if I went to NASA and um, I said, you know, I want, I want you to explain to me um, how this shuttle works or whatever. Like it, I just, I don't, because I didn't have all the physics, I didn't have all the chemistry, I didn't have all the engineering. Like it's just, it's just going to be impossible for me to understand these very technical things because I don't have this foundational understanding. And I think, I think people that kind of jump into these conversations and they want to talk about, well, God killed these people and God drowned these people, that that you just really can't have a uh, a, a fair conversation. Um, and let you begin at the place of these foundation, foundational truths about who God is. And so I, I'm, I'm sorry if I sound like I'm copping out. I just feel like it's, I defer to this God that I believe in, in the things that I don't understand. I still wrestle with them. I still am seeking answers. Um, but I, I don't know why God has done some of the things that he's done. Um, but I, but as I read scripture, I, mean, I, I see a lot of things that he has done and those things, the, the, the good things, the sacrificial things, the gracious things that he's done, they temper my response to the things that are difficult for me to swallow. Like what? The good things that he's done? Yeah. Um, well, I mean, the, the ultimate one is is the sacrifice of Christ upon the cross. I mean, that, that's the – all of Scripture um, – this is the way I would say it when I was a pastor. All of, all of Scripture is either – the gospel or its commentary on the gospel. And what I mean by that, all of scripture points to Jesus. Um, everything in the old Testament is a means of, um, drawing pictures, parallels, uh, it's preparation for the coming of Christ. It's, it's a, it's a, it's a demonstration of the futility of trying to keep, keep a law in order to be made right before God. It, it's presenting the need for Jesus. Then you have Jesus in the gospels. Then you have the rest of the new Testament that talks about the, how the life, death, and resurrection of gospel uh, of Jesus, um, through that the church was birthed, and how that gospel was then spread throughout the world. And so, um, I mean, if you're asking for how do I know that God is good, I mean that's that's the ultimate thing. And I know, <laughs> I know that uh, you you would probably say, well, how do you know that Jesus existed, or how do you know that he was resurrected? No, 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 I, no, no, no. Let me let me. <laughs> but but I would say that that's that's the clearest <laughs> thing that I that I would point to that God has, has revealed his love to me ultimately through Christ. And there's nothing else that he needs to, if he never did another thing for me, if he didn't bring me a beautiful wife, if he didn't bless me five kids, if he took it all away, like he did with Job, I believe that I could say with integrity, what he did on the cross for me, um, and not just for me, but for all people is enough. Um, and so, I mean, that's the thing that I would point to ultimately. <clears throat> Okay, uh, I mean, I don't, I don't see how killing someone killing their son is a good thing. Uh, it sounds terrible to me. Um, well, yeah, and I get that, but, but I, I again think like but to, you a, said, to a one year old getting a giant needle, giant needle in their arm doesn't sound good to them. Like, that, yeah, it's a little, that it's a little, it's a little different though because the one year old doesn't. Well, I mean, I know it's different. I know it's different. <laughs> it's different because the one year old doesn't do good things for people and bad things to people. The one year old is just barely existing. So we are human adults who understand compassion and morality and love and the facts of reality and torture and serial killers and rape. And we have a much greater understanding. So, um, 
I, I get that God is so much smarter, but you know, it's more like the parent teaching a toddler don't hit and then slapping them across the face. That's what God is doing. He's telling us not to do things and then he's doing them. And then when the, the kid ever looks back at us and goes, why do you tell me not to hit while you're slapping me? Um, the response is, trust me, there's shit you're going to understand later when you're older and you don't understand now. Yeah. It just seems, it's just not, nobody would look at that person and call them a good parent. But when God does it, it's just sort of accepted as, oh, do, do as God says, not as he does. You know, um, I guess I've had a missionary yeah. on the show. I've had a missionary on the show before. And I think part of the pushback came from this idea that he was almost sort of undercover in a way, like they would, um, they would go over and say, oh, we're here to teach English classes. Mm-hmm. And once the door was closed, they would sort of teach English, but it was for the purposes of reading the Bible. And they mm-hmm. were sort of teaching Christianity under this cloak. Uh, also building homes and feeding people, but it all came with Bible study. Meaning if someone did mm-hmm. not believe, did not want to believe, did not want to join the religion, but had no place to eat or live, they would come and sort of be forced to go through that in order to get their meal or their home built or to get fresh water or something like that. And that's something that sort of left a bad taste in my mouth about missionaries. So can you speak to that yeah. for a moment yeah. as far as your you, your humanitarian acts and how those overlap with with your your uh, your actual missionary work? Yeah, there I mean, there is no condition put on people having to believe like us or people having to convert. I mean, that's one of the things that, that, um, is, is a cornerstone of, of our faith. It's, it's not a confession. It's not, it's not like other religions that you, you know, you do this, this practice, you pray this number of times, you do this fast during this, this month, you do this, this, and this, and, um, you're good to go. And it doesn't matter what you, feel in your heart if you just recite these things that you don't even under, you might not even understand these prayers that you're praying but if you just recite them you're good um christianity is not like that christianity is an inward religion um i mean jesus talks often about the you know the pharisees and how their their religion they wore it on their sleeves and he calls he calls that out constantly and so i would i would say that in light of that i mean I, you're going to find bad missionaries. You're going to find bad pastors. You're going to, I mean, you're going to find people to do that. I mean, there, there, I will say there is this temptation. If you're depending on how you're funded, um, if you're not writing back good newsletters that, you know, you're seeing lots of converts and you're seeing this and this happen, then, you know, those, those donations might, you know, they might fall off. Um, and so there can be some missionaries that feel like they have to, they have to have good numbers. They have to have good stories. And so that can, you know, that can cause them to be more pushy in what their, you know, their ministry. But for us, I mean, for me personally, I would say that I, it, it, it makes no difference to have people that can simply recite a prayer or, or show up at a certain place um, on a Sunday morning or whatever. Um, it is all about heart transformation. And therefore, you know, it's like, it's like me putting a gun to somebody's head and say, love me. Like I get, I mean, you don't do that because it's not the way love works. You can't force someone to love you because you have a gun. I mean, they can say it, right? but they can't mean it. And the same thing, you can, you can say you have faith in Christ, but um, it means nothing unless there is this inward well, um, volition within you that, that compels you. And so if I'm, if I'm saying to someone, you come to faith and I'll feed you, I'm, I'm defeating uh, you know, I'm def- I'm, it's self-defeating. Well, I'm for not, what? Well, let me say though. Want. So, I, you 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 may not say that outwardly, but if they know that that's what they have to do to get food, and they show up and deal with the Bible study, that's going to happen. And I have to say, when when you when you just said, I'm not going to put a gun to my a gun to someone's head and say, "Love me," isn't that what the threat of hell is? That's exactly what it is. It's duress. It's Love me or go burn in hell, right? Well, I, I mean, that's – if that's reality, then isn't it a loving thing to communicate that to people? I mean, if I believe that's a – if that's the reality, it's unloving to not warn people. I mean, if a bridge is out and I say, you better turn around or you're going to die, I mean, that's that's a loving thing to tell someone to turn around and not drive off the bridge. I mean, that's – because that's the reality. Okay. So okay. Let me, reality. 
let me it's let me a add a piece thing to do. let me add a piece to your analogy so that we're on the same page. Yes, it is a loving thing to warn people that the bridge is about to go out. But you have to add in there that that the guy down the street is about to make the bridge explode because he has total control over it. And what you're saying is don't go over the bridge. It's about to explode. And then after it explodes, you're like, now I'm going to go love that guy who just destroyed it all. Like you're, you're right to save them from something terrible. I understand that that's your passion, but then you love the thing that you're saving. You you then love and worship the thing that you're saving them from. And that's what I don't understand. Yeah. And I don't well, know. I, you're I, just going to go back yeah, to the just, understanding I thing. Think I think that that's a, it's a, I'm sorry. I just feel no, like no, I, we'll I, end I up talking that. in circles. I, mean, I do think, yeah, sorry. I, we'll end up talking in circles because I think you'll, <laughs> you'll probably just well, say, say mm, yeah. I think we're on a delay. Um, I'm here now. Are you? There? Yeah, I'm good. I'm good. I, what I was getting at is, I, I think that that we may just end up talking in circles because uh, anything that I say, I don't understand about your faith. You're just going to tell me that, you know, you don't, you know, our understanding isn't isn't close enough to God's. God has all the answers, and I just to well, me it's just circular. You, you would say that you're a, a naturalist or a yeah, I, I I usually don't get into those debates of methodological naturalism. Um, I, I find that they. Well, can... I I would, yeah. Well, I would just say that I I mean to me, you have you have an assumption about how we got here. Would you say that you understand every aspect of of that, or are there things that you just say? The, the other evidence that I have is so overwhelming that even the gaps are not enough to cause me to think otherwise. What I would say is that I started in your position, did a lot of research, ended up discovering that for what we know now, naturalism is the best explanation. I don't just wholeheartedly accept it. And I think the reason I push back is because, like earlier, you said, you said that yeah, God has done some things that in the Bible that make me uncomfortable, and some way, like he, he, you sort of acknowledged that he had done bad things, and then you said, but all of the good things he's done uh, are sort of worth overlooking all of the bad things, and and I want to focus on that. And then when I asked you what it was, you gave me one example of him basically killing his son for us, which sounds terrible. So I, I don't know that there are any other good things that you would be able to say. I mean, other than like human sacrifice is his one good contribution. Like what is so great about God that makes you overlook all the terrible things? Like what what else has he done that has impressed you so much? I, Well, he I mean. I believe that he spoke all of creation into existence. And I, I, I mean, so I go back to, I mean, this idea of naturalism. I mean, I, I, I know that there are those that say that, you know, the evolutionary theory, it's not a theory, it's, it's proven. But I, I don't think that there's anyone that can trace it from the very first sign of life and trace it, you know, all the little, the little um, changes over time that they're, they're just, you can't, you can't do that. No, nobody can do that. And when, you know, when you ask a question about, well, how did, you know, you have these transitional fossils and you have, you have one and it's got this thing that looks like it might've been used for something else at some point, And you point to those and you realize, well, there's, there's probably thousands that would have been in between those that, um, but we can't really exactly pinpoint exactly how this process worked. Um, but yet, millions of people accept evolution as fact. And I would, I would say that, you know, I know you're saying that I, I am accepting of a God, even though I don't understand certain things. I, I mean, I, I think that others do that as well with other, other issues. And I think one of the issues in, in these discussions is everybody has to play by the same rules. And I don't think that there is anybody that can spell out from the very first sign. Of, I mean, just forget biogenesis, like where, where things, where the, the first life came from, but from that first life to now, nobody can spell all that out. And so there, there are lots of assumptions that people make. I mean, I understand that people say, well, you, the God of the gaps, you know, you, everything that you can explain, you explain by, 
by God of the gaps. And I mean, I think there's an evolution of the gaps too. Like there, if you ask somebody like, if, if you ask somebody, well, how did the circulatory system evolve? You know, how, the veins, the, the blood, the need for blood, the heart, how old did all those things evolve? I mean, the answer that I've seen is, well, over millions of years, you know, these things came together and it's so hard that it was so slow and it was so gradual that it would, you know, that, that you just can't even comprehend it. Well, I mean, that's, that's an evolution of the gaps. That's, that's an acknowledging that we don't know exactly how it all worked out, but we think that the, the other evidence is, is overwhelming. So we're just going to accept it. And I would say that you got, you know, we can play by that same rule and say, I, I don't know how it all works, but I would say that um, <clears throat> what I, what I see in scripture, what I see in creation points me to a good God who, who, um, is sovereign over everything, and so. Okay, um, so so I I, I I get it. You, I can be accused accused of not having. <clears throat> I'm sorry. Yeah, that that's just not. Those two aren't on the, on even footing. They're just not. Um, and it comes down because of the word inference. I think. I think inference is the is this, um, is the dividing word that 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 changes why we're not equal when it comes to that, or at least our views aren't equal when it comes to that. We're not on this. It's not like we're both in the same league and we play for different teams. Um, Because inference is specifically coming to a conclusion using evidence and reasoning. So just logic, right? So inference, it would be an inference to assume, um, or it would be, it would be logical to infer that t- tomorrow we're going to see the sun because it's happened over and over and over and over. Um, when we pull a specimen's DNA and look at it under a microscope and we pull a specimen's DNA that's somewhat related to it, we can infer that these two things are related. You can look at the DNA of broccoli and the DNA of cauliflower and go, this is, this is basically the same thing from a DNA perspective, from a genetic perspective. Um, you can look at bananas and pineapples and see how different they are, but see some genetic similarities. You can put your hands on the, on the science. You can measure the acidity. You can measure the sugar count. You can um, see how long it takes to grow them. You can look at the sizes and the colors. There's a lot you can empirically prove about plants or animals being related. You can take DNA tests. Would you say that infer and prove is this? I'm sorry, inf- just before you go on, infer and prove, are you using those no. synonymously that because no. you can infer something, you can therefore prove it? No. Okay. What I'm saying so, is okay. I'm saying wanna... is that to infer that um, a gorilla is related to a chimpanzee makes a whole lot of sense when you pull the DNA. When you look at the mannerisms of the creatures, when you see how they live in the jungle, when you see how they operate with food, you see how they operate in family environments, when you see their skin and their fur and everything about them or their hair, everything that you see about their eyes, and then you look at them under a microscope and you can see the DNA patterns and how closely related they are. Um, And then you look at chimpanzees under the microscope next to humans and go that it's like 98.9% the same. You have a human DNA, a human genome, and the the, the, the chimpanzee genome. 98.9% identical. It makes a lot of logical sense to infer that the two are related. And you can take that all the way back to fish and amoebas and everything else. There's going to be different levels of relation, different levels of similarity. And I think if you look at like a banana under a microscope and a human, it's like 50% the same. So to say that we're all connected yeah, in some yeah, in some scientific way by looking at empirical data is one thing based in science on the other side of the coin. You are professing a belief in a literal magical invisible deity who can speak things into existence. That is nowhere near in the same league that we're playing in, in scientific means. You are saying that there is a a creature that lives in a, you're, you're saying that there's a creature that lives in, in a plane that we don't have access to, but can cross planes is outside of time. And Christopher Hitchens said it best when he said extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence. So 
to say that we're both having a little bit of faith or we're both sort of skipping over things and just trusting experts. And yeah, maybe, maybe technically that's the case. But when you lay these two out side by side, I have reasonable, logical reasons to make inferences and you are making giant leaps of faith and telling other people to do the same, lest they be tortured for eternity. And I would say that what you're professing sounds far more like a a fable or a fairy tale or very difficult to prove, in fact, impossible to prove, as to where something that you can look at empirically under a microscope and make a logical inference would be much easier to do. So to say that we both have stuff we can't prove, I don't think is necessarily uh, doing justice to the conversation. Well, I, a couple... A couple things I would ask. So, commonalities between, and I'm, I'm, I mean, I've heard the, the statistics about the DNA that we share with apes. But, you know, the similarities there, and how that could that could infer a common um, ancestor. Could could you not also? I mean, could you not infer a common creator that used some of the same things? I mean, if, like if no, perhaps chimpanzees are oh. on. Well, perhaps, Earth, but I think it would Earth, be. And you have humans on Earth. Would it make sense to have one person to, you know, per, people to breathe air, and then that the creator would create something else for the chimpanzee, to, or that um, humans would would be sustained by one kind of um, food, you know, that's that's found in abundance, but you know, animals would be they would have to have some other kind of food that was completely different because, you know, for them to eat a, a leaf off a plant would not do anything for them. I mean, to me, if you're going to say that some, the 98% infers common descent, I, I mean, I think you could also say it, inf- it could infer the common creator. Like, it's like cars, like Toyota makes a truck and Chevy makes a truck. They both have round rubber tires, not because they're made by the same, by the same people or in the same factory, but because they, they have to play by the same rules on the road. And so I, I get that you can you can infer that, but I think you can infer other things too. Yeah, so I don't think that it would make sense for that creator to be called intelligent. Because why would he replicate genetic mistakes? Why would why would one in thirty three human births result in a in a birth defect? Why would we have like massive genetic issues uh, within humans that are also seen in chimpanzees like why why are random you know a, a random alligator is born completely albino and miss one's missing a tail and snakes are born fused yeah. together with two heads these like if you look at this from a biological perspective and say random mutation sometimes happens then we can it's it makes sense again the inference is there but when you invoke god as the intelligent creator and an, a designer that only begs thousands of more questions as to all the problems that we deal with. If humanity is your reason for being here yet you send or allow tornadoes and earthquakes and hurricanes and things get ripped apart and destroyed, including churches, including houses of worship, including, you know, uh, pastors uh, who are doing great things for the community. Now you're, Invoking God only begs thousands of more questions, but if you take the stance that back up and go, wait a minute, evolution is not about perfection. Evolution is about adaptation to a specific environment and surrounding. And so it's about adapting. It's about adapting and making, making changes, not linear going from dumb to genius, right? It's not going from simple to super complex. It's about, it's about adaptation and evolution doesn't care about you. Evolution doesn't love you. The the climate, the evolution of our planet doesn't love you or care about you, and it doesn't consider you. It doesn't care what you're doing when when the um, the uh, plates start to move under the earth. It doesn't care if it's a convenient time during your meeting or birthday party or wedding. It, it just happens because it happens independent of a creator putting things into motion. So no, I, I don't think that having similarities in design points to a similar one creator because it would really mean that that creator is replicating multiple mistakes, multiple mutations, and, you know, causing one in 33 human births to have a defect. I don't see how we can look at something like that and, and call that, uh, that, that designer intelligent. I think it makes much more sense to look at the empirical data and say that this, 
This is a natural evolutionary process. Well, I, I, I think, I mean, to go back into scripture, I mean, I think there is an explanation for much of the um, suffering, the, the issues that we have with, with genetics. I mean, I think, I think the Bible gives an explanation for that. But my, as, I, as I think about this idea of inference, I, I don't know how you get from inference to proof. I can see how you could say, well, the more things that infer, the closer you can get to proving, but you can't actually prove. And I think you have to say that, well, it's possible that that it it points to something else. And you, you mentioned logic and reason. Well, I mean, some of the things that have to have, had to have happened for evolution to take hold for, for, you know, from the very beginning to all the way up through now you have to accept that things happen that don't happen. Um, I mean, you talk about creation and inference, like we infer that every creation has a creator. We, we infer that laws have lawgivers. We, we, we infer that causes have effects. Those are things that we see today. Um, we, we infer that, um, order, um, is not, uh, doesn't come out of chaos unless there's some other organizing factor. Um, and, but those are all things that you had to, if, for evolution to happen, you had to um, have something created out of nothing, which we, we don't have anything thing to point. We can't point to anything in creation um, that, that we see today that we can observe today where things are being created out of thin air. Um, I think about laws. I, I mean, oh. Where, where do we see, you know, laws in a country that exists without there being some lawgiver? Um, where do we see causes um, that, or where do we see effects that don't, that are not produced by causes? I mean, to me, when you talk about using logic and reason and inferring, there are lots of things that I think we can use if we're if we're playing by the same rules to infer. Well, but that we don't something though. beyond us that created it. But we don't play by the same rules because if, if I why, why, why well because we you think well because you just said that something can't exist without being created. But you believe your God was never created, so you get to invoke magic anytime you want and say God doesn't pertain to these rules. Everything else, everything that exists was created. But I can't I can't play by that same. I can't. You won't meet me there. You won't say, well, you're right. Something can no. exist without being created. And by the way, if you do any study into uh, quantum mechanics, you'll find that virtual particle pairs do pop in and out of existence, and theoretical physicists aren't exactly sure why. They're studying it, and different people have different theories on it, but we do see uh, quantum particle pairs exist and then vanish and then exist and then vanish. And we don't know, is it our visibility? Are they actually coming in and out of existence? What's happening? There's a lot to learn about the universe, but I'm okay with ignorance. I'm okay with saying we don't know yet, but let's keep going. I'm okay with the journey, but I don't get to invoke magic at any point, but you can, you can lay out your worldview and you can say, here's all the rules that atheists have to play by and would fail at. But when I say, well, then, then, then what created God, you get to invoke magic and say nothing, he's always existed. Well, why can't that be the answer for the universe? Yeah. Is that what science says? I, I thought science, I mean... Well, when I say the universe, has, I mean... Has there been some universal... There, I mean, there had been this universal idea that there... You know, because it's expanding, there had to have been a point when it... Right, but that doesn't mean... Was, you know, there's no, I a get singularity it. that there... I get it, but that doesn't mean that that didn't happen as a result of the explosion of another universe. This could have been just happening forever. How do we know? And my point is, we don't know. But how is that claim any different than a a a, a creator? I mean, I, to me, there, there's 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 no way to. I mean, that's where I say play by the same rule. I mean, you're saying I have this magic god um, out here, and you're saying, well, no, it, you know that you're just invoking magic, but. The other side is there are this this infinite number of explosions and um, that were new universes were birthed out of old ones. But I mean, that's how, why why is that less magical to you? And, and and also like the idea of gravity. Where 
Hold on, is, hold is on. Don't don't give me too much to hold on. Don't give me too much to address in one thing because it's <laughs> it's known as a gish gallop, and it's re- I don't know what sorry. to do when I have three or four different things. So so okay, uh, sorry. so the the idea here and the difference between us is I am not asserting knowledge of an an everlasting explosion of universe. Remember, I said it could be this. I don't know. It could have always existed. I don't know. It could have come from the singularity. I don't know. And trust me, there are people who have studied this for 50 years who disagree with each other on what they think happened. Okay? Yeah. So us not really yeah, yeah. knowing or us not – I mean I've had, I've had Neil deGrasse Tyson on this show a couple of times. I've had Lawrence Krauss on this show multiple times. And they used my show to argue with each other, uh, with each other and poke fun at each other um, about, <laughs> about even the differences between a hypothesis versus a theory. Like they, they argued with each other. And I think Neil deGrasse Tyson said through my show to Lawrence, he said, um, he calls it, is it a theory of everything or a hypothesis of everything? And then he like walked away from the microphone, making fun of Lawrence, (laughs) Lawrence Krauss's book. Um, so, so there are people way above my pay grade who have studied this for much longer and still don't fully, uh, agree. There is no consensus there, but remember I said, it could be this. I said it could be. I said it could all have always existed. Uh, abiogenesis, we're looking into it. I'm okay with that. But you, on the other hand, are asserting knowledge of a specific God who has chosen people, who has specific attributes, and really cares about what I eat, which way the animal is facing when it is slaughtered before I eat it, what day I eat on it, what day I wear certain fabrics, what fabrics I'm allowed to wear together, what creatures I'm allowed to eat versus which ones are unclean, details about you know split hooves versus chewing cud versus a bat being a bird. He is so very specific and he really cares who I have sex with. He really cares where I go on Sunday and whether or not something is covering my head when I speak about God and whether or not I'm a woman because having a penis versus a vagina is going to have a drastic difference in the amount of authority you have in your own home and in your own church. You have driven down and gotten so specific to your claims of knowledge without the evidence that your initial claim is even remotely true. I am okay with saying, yeah, it appears that these creatures are biologically diverse yet somehow related let's keep diving into that and right now this is the going theory this is the going concept Mm -hmm. with multiple aspects of proof by the way because evolution has been proven they didn't just infer it it has been proven and you can go step by step through it if you're willing to spend the time to research it you can find it i recommend everyone go to talkorigins.org as a good uh, a good step Uh, Richard Dawkins' book, uh, The Greatest Show on Earth, uh, has a great experiment about how they manipulated and witnessed, like actually observed guppy evolution and showing how things shift according to their environment. And we can even get into speciation as to what civets can mate with other civets, and yet they're still considered in the cat family or cat kind when we talk to creationists, yet they can't reproduce with certain other types of cats. So you can get through this 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 biologically diverse situation. But I'm not making a state. I'm not saying no, for sure, here's how the universe was created. And not only do I know how it was created, but that universe wants you to eat certain things on Fridays, wants you to kill your sheep and rub some blood outside on a rock or it's going to kill you. And by the way, if you don't believe this certain thing, it's going to put you into another universal planet of fire if you don't believe all the things I'm telling you without proof. So that when I say we're not, we're not in the same league having the same discussion, that's what I mean. Your side often has to invoke knowledge that you don't know for sure, profess faith, which is hoping or pretending to know something you're really not completely sure of, and saying things are facts that you can't demonstrate. I'm okay with saying, here's the best option that we have right now, and it seems to make the most logical sense, but I'm not proclaiming this as the end-all, be-all truth. All right. Was that one of those gish gat or whatever you said? A little bit. I was really more <laughs> answering. I was really more uh, answering your question, <laughs> but uh, answering mine. Okay. Answers are a little longer um, than the question, typically. So, yeah. So, to, so I get it that you say you don't know 
how things started. And I, and I guess that makes, I mean, you're an atheist, agnostic atheist or atheist agnostic. Is that, I would say most, that? most atheists are agnostic atheists where we can acknowledge that there is some information missing, but atheism deals with belief. So yeah, you can be missing knowledge, but with the knowledge you do have, do you have a belief or not? And, and I would say right now, no God that has been proposed has sufficient evidence to warrant my belief. Therefore I'm an atheist. Because I, I think I think you can exist as an agnostic in theory, but not in practice. Because you end up living a certain way according to a certain set of beliefs, and you can say, "Well, I don't I don't know, you know, how how we got here, but I, but you're essentially I would I mean I if if this is wrong, forgive me, but you're living as though there is no God that there is that even though we don't know what it is, there is some sort of naturalistic explanation. So I, I would say by, even though you would say, well, I don't know how it all happened. you you orient your life in such a way that reflects either that it happened in a naturalistic way or it happened according to a, a God. And so I, 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 that's one of the things I think that agnostics, they feel like they can get out of being pigeonholed because they say, well, I just don't know, but no one, no one lives that way. No one lives as though they don't know things. I mean, they all make truth claims. They all assert certain rights and certain principles. And so, and, and to me, you can't, those things don't exist in a vacuum. They exist according to a worldview, to an understanding of, of creation and nature. And so you may say, I, 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 from my understanding, I don't want to put words in your mouth, that you, you could say that, well, I don't know how it happened and I'm open, but, but, Today, you're living as though there is a naturalistic explanation, even though you don't, you know, that naturalistic explanation would not be complete, that there are still gaps in it. Um, and so I, I think that I don't think I don't think anybody gets to step away from the table and say, well, this doesn't affect me because I, I'm just saying I don't know. I, th- I think I think by the way that we live our lives, we're we're making a statement in some way about what we believe. And so um I, I mean, I live in what, you know, that I would say, I hope that my life is lived in such a way that it, it reflects my belief on a divine creator that created me that, and that, but not only created me, but desires to have fellowship with me. And so, um, I, I would say that, um, you, you mentioned something about fish guppies and all, all those things. Um, and <coughs> I, <laughs> I know people say, well, if you can have microevolution, then then what's why couldn't you have macro? And other people would say, there's no there's no difference between there's no micro, there's no macro. It's just evolution. Um, but I, I would say that that um, if if those are the things that we point to, civets and guppies, that 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 somehow. And I know there's lots of other stuff out there. I, I know you didn't like give an exhaustive list of everything that points to evolution being being fact. Um, but I, I think if you have to go back and say, well, we have these inferences, then that, that signifies that there are some things, there are some gaps that you're having to jump over that with an inference that, because you, there's, there's, a, there's something in there that we just, we just don't know. And I, and I too, I, I, I know people will say that a biogenesis is completely separate from evolution, but to me, it's like, it's like saying, taking your remote, turn on your TV and saying, well, I know how a TV works. Like, no, there's thousands of things that have to happen to make that TV work in order for you to even get to the place that you can turn that TV on. To me, to say, well, we don't know how, how it all started, but from this point on, we actually got lies. We, well, hold we on, hold on, hold on, out. hold on. Like, aren't you doing... You aren't can't you, even build that second, wait, first and second story until you've gotten that foundation. Aren't you doing that exact same thing by not being able to tell me where God came from? I, I agree, but I'm saying the, we have to play by the same rules. I'm saying that I believe in a God that was uncreated. You're saying that there was, and, and you're saying that that's, that's, a, that's a statement based solely on faith. It can't be proven. You can't, there's no empirical evidence. Well, the gap, the gap there saying, is massive, yes, though. I the, the, ga- the gap, I the gap is like, look, if, if we're stepping over tiny cracks, not understanding, you know, how the chimpanzee, uh, like what's missing between the chimp and the human 
and there, we go in ninety eight point nine percent of the of the DNA is spot on. We're missing something minor here. We're stepping over cracks in the road. You're leaping over the Grand Canyon here. I mean, you, you have you well, you have I mean, no you have no evidence of something Grand Canyon. You have no evidence of something that has just always existed and can exist and think and just always be with no creation at all. But you just assert that it happened and move on with that as your foundation. That is one of the biggest leaps of faith. We're not saying it just happened. And, and Don't I think about it. We are faith. researching. We are con- like the study of abiogenesis is a massive part of of biological discovery institutes. Like they are. That's exactly what tons and tons of people are are focused on because we want to know how it could happen. So we're, we don't know, but we're still looking like, I think that's a beautiful thing, but it's not. Well, And that's, and that's great. Yeah. I mean, I, I think that science, I mean, I, I'm not, I don't think anybody, I mean, I'm, I'm glad it look, scour the universe, scour, you know, (laughs) biology to, to help us learn more. But I, but to, to characterize that, you know, we just have this little Grand Canyon. You know, we have this big Grand Canyon that we're having to step over, um, whereas you just have these small cracks with chimpanzees and stuff. When there, there's not a, there's not a, an understanding of where, where that life came from. The very first life, where that came from, how you went from elements to to life, to biological life. I mean, to me, another thing is is just gravity. Where where did gravity come from? Was it is it eternal? Is it what what maintains it? Like why does it, why is it a constant? Um, like to me, from a naturalistic perspective, gravity takes on deistic properties. I mean, it's eternal, it's authoritative. I mean, it ha- it exerts an influence on all of creation, but it's um, you can't you can't see it. You can see the effects of it, but you can't see it. Where I mean, where where did where did gravity? come from what what co- i mean i know what they you know what causes gravity but what what caused that to cause gravity um and my point is is that yes we are making statements of faith and we're we're living or i'm living according to those statements of faith but i think you have to play by the same rules and say we're we're living based on on statements of faith we don't know how it all works but we think it works we think that there is a naturalistic and we are orienting our lives around that to me, that's just as much a faith proposition. And to 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 not say it is to say that it's well, but we have science on our side, so therefore it's not technically faith. I just think that's I think that's kind of not telling the whole story. Well, the difference is we can demonstrate gravity. We can show that it works. We can show that it's real. But you, you can't. You, but hold can on. you explain it? Hold on. Can you explain where it came from? No, but we can demonstrate it. We can demonstrate that it exists. Well, to me, Okay, and you can't demonstrate that God. I know. Exists. Yeah, yeah, you definitely. So again, we're not in the same leap. But we're not on even foot. Can you demonstrate where gravity came from? Can you demonstrate where it came from? You're asking me to to tell you where God came from. I'm asking you. Can you tell me where gravity came from? Like L- where? Listen, it, listen. Not, this is what I'm what I'm getting at is. I, I mean, we we agree that it exists. Right. What I'm getting at here is, you can't even demonstrate that God exists. Once you, and in trying to, you keep saying that he always existed. We know that gravity is a real thing. We do not know that God is a real thing. God being a real thing is a belief. I don't have faith that gravity exists. We both know that gravity exists. We can't say the same about God. You have faith that he exists. I don't believe well, see, that. I, I someone, can't the, deny, someone can't deny, someone can't deny. The law of gravity exists. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Oh, I was going to say, I I believe the law of gravity exists because there is a law giver because there, there's a source of gravity. And what I'm saying is you're, you're saying that gravity, you you don't have an explanation for why it exists. Yes, it exists and we can see it. And I would say that's evidence that we have a law giver. I mean, to me that the fact that we have gravity points to the fact, the point, the fact that we have a law of gravity points to the fact that we have a law giver who maintains that and not just put it into motion, but sustains it. Like, I mean, how can we, how can we calculate these comet Haley's comet? I remember seeing that when I was in elementary school, like, how could they calculate that? Um, if, if there wasn't something sustaining all of these constants and we say, well, gravity sustains it. Well, what sustains gravity? Why, why is it self-existent? I mean, it's, 
I, I don't understand why a naturalist would be quick to give godlike properties to gravity, um, but then deny that God could even exist. I didn't say that. I didn't say that God couldn't exist. I've said repeatedly during this episode, God could exist and be a terrible person. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But it, it just seems, it seems so disingenuous though, for you to say, well, if you can't tell me where gravity exists, therefore God, like the, what, how are you doing that? Like that, it, it if I can't tell you, well, the aren't, beginning aren't the of thing? if, if I, I can't can tell you where God is, well, let me let me let me finish this. Science? I can't hear you when I'm talking. If if I can't tell you where Sorry. gravity started, then I should just accept your giant leap that a magical invisible being created it, and I should worship him, or I'm going to go to hell. I mean, that's why I called your 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 leap the Grand Canyon. I mean, what are we doing here? I mean, we we can demonstrate that gravity is real, I and mean, we just can. And so to not know the origins of it or to talk about how, yeah, you throw anything giant out in space, you can watch it work. That's how satellites work. That's how you and I are talking to each other right now on opposite sides of the world is because gravity is real and is keeping that satellite in motion for you to stay connected. So th- this is I- – I can't even believe you're you're sort of trying to – back me into a corner to explain where gravity came from or else I have to admit I have faith in gravity. Like th- that's such, that just leads to absurdity, man. That, that has nothing to do with really what we're talking about. I'm saying that there are always going to be bits and pieces of things that we don't know. I could talk about the sun coming up tomorrow and you could say, well, there's going to be a gap of information. Sure. But would you call it faith that we have faith that the sun is going to come up tomorrow? I mean, sure. In some loose interpretation of the word perhaps we could say faith but i don't know that that's necessary i think it's reasonable and logical to infer that the sun will be visible tomorrow because it has done so repeatedly for literally millions of years okay well then we go back to gravity we know gravity it works we know gravity exists we know gravity is a real thing so it's reasonable to infer that it started somewhere and we're researching to see the origins or how cool it is to think about something like that or something like dark matter or something like black holes. There's tons of stuff in science that we know exists but don't fully understand. You're missing both pieces. You can't even prove your God exists, let alone where it could have came from or the fact that it didn't come from anything at all. So you're making this huge assertion that your God has always existed but nothing else ever has. And then your next leap is that God exists right now, but you can't demonstrate that. Everything else in science that we're talking about, we at least know it's real, but you're tasking me with if I can't tell you the origins of that specific thing, I'm somehow filled with faith? That's that's not a fair declaration at all. That's not my position at all. Well, I, I don't I don't mean to take us off into absurdity. That's not my intention. But I, I do feel like, David, we have to play by the same rules. And you're, you're saying that because I can't explain to you where God came from or because I can't explain difficult things in Scripture, that that, that, that that burden of proof is on me. And if I can't do that, then it's not reasonable to believe in God. And so that's why I'm asking you to... to um, okay. To, okay. I get what you're saying. But here, I mean, here's the, the deal. Do you though. not see the parallel there? Like, I feel like I, feel I like do, you're but I think me something. But when I ask you the same thing, you're saying, "Well, that's not." Okay, let me let me explain the difference. If I were to tell you that gravity's real, and I believe in gravity, and you believe in gravity, and we acknowledge gravity, but sometimes in my room, my bed just floats. You'd be like, "That is not how gravity operates, David." No, trust me, dude. In my room. <laughs> My bed floats, and it's random. Sometimes it happens, sometimes it doesn't. Then you would be able to hold me to task for either not living in reality, lying about what's happening in my room, or more likely suffering from some sort of delusion that in my room alone, I can defy gravity. What we're talking about in your faith is that your God says he is one way, gives us the way he's going to operate, and then does the exact opposite. And I, I go, how can, you, how can you love a God and worship a God that's literally going to burn people for eternity for not hearing about him? 
That is a contradiction within its own existence. How can God say, I love you, and then drown everybody on earth? How can Jesus be known as the Prince of Peace? Yet in Matthew 10, 34, he says, Do not think that I came to bring peace. I did not come to bring peace. I came to set a man against his father and a daughter against her mother. How can we say he's a prince of peace when he clearly says he didn't come for peaceful reasons? Those are the contradictions. Those are the contradictions. with. I don't want you to address it. I I know you've got an answer for that stuff. My point is that my issues with your faith is that your own believing principles within your own bubble are contradictory within themselves. There is nothing innately contradictory about gravity. There is nothing innately contradictory about abiogenesis. We are researching to see where it started, but we know that we exist. We know that we are related. You know that you are related to your cousins. Your cousins are related to cousins. You're related to people back to the 1800s, 1600s, and we can trace lineage and DNA back at least 50 to 80,000 years, maybe 250,000 years. We, we can trace DNA back to locations. Okay, so we know that we exist. Where did it start? We don't know. My, so my gaps in not knowing the origin of gravity is not equal to your gap in not knowing how God would create a literal torture chamber in another dimension for people who have never heard of him. Do you see the difference? Like one is one is a super far-fetched, extraordinary claim, and the other one is a basis in science and reality saying we don't know the end of this, but we're looking for it. So it's not fair to call us both faithful. That's what well, I'm getting I, at. No, I, I would – again, David, where, where you say that, you know, we don't know how biogenesis works. We don't – we don't know, you know, if we're the we're – the, child of another galaxy or another universe um like i mean i just don't i don't understand you saying that i have these grand canyon leaps where i mean nothing exists if those if there isn't if those if those things don't happen then there is nothing and so evolution is irrelevant if okay there's no possible way that, that we that life came from non-life or that something came from nothing. Um, and so I, I feel like they're, I mean, I get it. Your, your scientists are studying that and science and, but that doesn't mean that it's, that it's more scientific. I mean, it's because logic and reason tells us in everything that we see, if you, you go in a lab, you're going to, and you find anything that's been created, you're going to be able to tie that back to some creator. If you um, go in a lab and you see any, effect you're going to be able to go back to some cause um if you go anywhere where you find um order you're going to be able to point back to some sort of intelligence some sort of information organizing information like those are things we those are scientific principles that are found form the foundation of science and what what evolution teaches us what what naturalism teaches us that all of those things didn't exist in order for us to get here like that the, 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 there were our creation came into existence because they were the single events in all of creation and all of time and all of eternity where those rules of logic, those rules of science didn't have to take place. And so I would say that, you know, we're not you can't study God in a lab, but that doesn't mm-hmm. mean that there are not scientific means by which you can come to say that God is reasonable, that he that his existence is reasonable. Okay. Um, I think part of the problem here is the usage of the word nothing and something. Uh, like th- th- this could get this could go down a rabbit hole that I really I would rather get back on our c- conversation about morality and and answer your question that you originally wrote in of of, of what would it take would, for me t- to believe so, yeah, that'd be great. and and I want I want to <laughs> get into all that but I, I'm telling you that yeah if you were to look out into space far enough and see just just dark matter. You would just look at that and you would call that nothing. We all would. We'd go, what's out there? Nothing. You could open a box and look inside it and go, there's nothing in the box because it's an empty box. But there are things in that box. There are, there could be viruses in that box. There could be particles in that box. There, there is oxygen in that box. 
There are tiny microscopic particles shaved off from the corrugated paper that is used to make the cardboard that we would look at and go, that, we can't see that. But if you were to analyze the inside of that box with a microscope, there's a lot of stuff going on inside that box that we would say nothing is in there. And if you were to look out into space at dark matter, you would say, there's nothing, there's nothing there. But did you know dark matter actually has weight? It weighs something. There's a, there's a formula that was found by NASA. I, it's a 2.241 times 10 to the negative 27th power for anybody who wants to look it up. There is a weight to that. So if we were to look at it with the naked eye and say, you can't, you can't get something from nothing. Well, black, empty, dark space is not nothing. So it's a fundamental understanding of different principles and particles and, and quantum mechanics and things that are way above both of our pay grade. So, well, I, I get that. Let me try. I, mean, a, I, I, I know Lawrence Krauss talks about about that. And, yeah, I watched him talk. I, I think you're using. I'm, I was just going to say I watched him talk for two hours about nothing, and I still don't understand it. <laughs> well, I, I wouldn't have much hope then. <laughs> but I, I mean, I think when we say we look in a box and we say there's nothing, I mean, I, we're using that kind of colloquially. Like, I mean, if you if you will say well. Like if you if you came to me and said, "Is there anything in this box?" I said nothing. Well, and you'd say, "Well, is there air in there? Are there are other molecules. Could there be bits of skin in there?" Well, yeah, there's something there. And I I I mean, if if the way that the way that believers typically use the word nothing is is nothing. Like like if you can weigh something, if you can weigh dark matter, then it's not nothing. Exactly. Um, it's it's technically something, and so, but when Christians talk about creating something out of nothing, we're saying that there's there's you couldn't weigh anything. There was there was nothing. God didn't need anything. I mean, ex, ex nihilo, like out right. of nothing. Like okay, that's, so that's, so that's so what, what we're would, talking about? So what would you say if I were to tell you dark matter has always existed and had no creation? I would say I would say that's a faith statement because there's no. I mean, how how can you how can you make that? Anytime you talk about infinity is a faith statement. So if you're going to say it's already exist, always existed, then you're making a faith. A right. Faith, so if someone pro- instead faith proposition. So if someone instead says, maybe it has always existed. Let's look into it. That's the position of scientists. We don't know. Yeah. We ad- we admit a lack of knowledge. And then spend millions and millions of dollars trying to understand our universe. Those who claim that an invisible being created it all are not in the field of science. That is not what science deals with. Science doesn't deal with like creative, imaginative things within the realm of magic. Science deals with things that are falsifiable and there is an answer to the question, either yes or no, of did dark matter always exist? There is a definitive answer to that. And so because it's falsifiable, yeah, yeah. science can begin studying it because there's either a yes or a no. But with God, we could, we could dig up a tomb someday, find the bones, be able to test them, and then trace the lineage and find out that this is the bones of Jesus. He was a cult leader and never actually went to heaven. Mm-hmm. And millions of people would still be Christians because it doesn't matter. Yeah, yeah. So the, the the DNA, the facts, the science, it will always be pushed aside because facts are rarely a match for emotion. So I want to I want to try one more yeah. ana- I want to try one more analogy real quick uh, to see if we can just get out of religion and think about it this way. Let's imagine that we are the next door neighbors and we both walk outside and you have this beautiful red sports car in your driveway and my driveway is empty. And I say, Oh my God, that's a beautiful car. You're like, thanks man. I go, what color is it? And you go, it's red. And I go, Oh, uh, how, how big is the engine? You go, Oh, it's a, it's a brand new V8. Oh, that's cool. What kind of car is it? Oh, it's a Corvette. Just came off the line. Man, that's amazing. Um, 
How fast does it go? Uh, 240 miles an hour. God, that's amazing. What color is the interior? It's charcoal. Man, your car is amazing. What are those... Uh, what do those rims cost? Oh, they're $800 a piece. Man, you've got a beautiful car there. And then I go, I got an awesome car too. Oh, you do? Where is it? Uh, I haven't seen it, but it's amazing. And you're like, how do you, how do you have a car that you don't know where it came from? You don't know where it is. You can't point. What color is your car? I don't know. What color is the interior? No clue. How much do the wheels cost? I don't know. But trust me, I've got an amazing sports car that's exactly like yours. And then you're like, how can you make this claim without showing me your car? And I go, what city was your car built in? You're like, I don't know. And I go, see, we're both living on faith. That's what's happening in this conversation. The things that I'm talking about, we know exist. The things that I'm talking about, we can describe. The things that I'm talking about, we can observe and empirically prove exists. Me not knowing where, you not knowing where the car was built or what date it was created does not mean we both have equal amounts of faith. I hope that clarifies my position on that whole discussion. Well, I mean, yeah, I I, I get the, I get the analogy. I I would just say that the, the beginning of it all, I mean, you can't get to, I mean, it's like I was saying with algebra, like unless you can figure out one plus one, you can't, you can't get to algebra or evolution without understanding all of it. And, and at least right now, it's, it's a huge leap of faith for the naturalist to think of where were the, the things, where did the things come from that led to the big bang that where, where were the things that from the big bang that led to, um, biological life? Um, th- those are, I mean, those are huge. How are you steps, calling it a How are you calling it a leap of faith if we're saying we don't know, but we're looking into it? How is that faith? You're not saying the, that about the, God. You're I not saying you're not saying I don't know if God exists. I, I'm looking into it. You're no, you're, you're making a a, a a very positive truth claim that it does exist. How are you saying that science is saying we're not I, sure I how it started? That, yeah, I, I would say that you're making a positive claim too by the way that you live. You're either living as though God exists or you're living as though he doesn't exist. Because I think it's so the you best may, possible. You may say, I, don't, I don't know. You may say, I don't know whether or not we were, you know, that we came from these, you know, multiple iterations of universes or I don't even know if God exists. I'm agnostic about that. But I would say you're orienting your life around either the fact that he does or the assumption that he doesn't. And so I don't think you can separate. Well, I, in theory, I'm, I'm agnostic, but I would say in practice you are you are making claims about what you believe to be true. Yeah, because I do think that that's the most reasonable explanation as of right now. That's the best we have going right now. Like right now, if I if I go yeah. for if I go for a run and I pull my hamstring, I'm going to come sit on a pack of ice when I get home. Does that not mean in 40 years someone's yeah. going to say, "Hey, we've actually done a discovery that if you rub mayo on it, it works better than ice." Yeah. All right, cool. I'm going to try that and if it works for me, I'm down. Yeah. <laughs> but right now, I'm still going to keep putting yeah. ice on it until I have more evidence to the contrary. Um, yeah. let's do this. I want to I want to I want to answer your question about morality. I don't want you to think I'm sidestepping it. I want to get into that because I do judge God's morality. I do. And I judge it based off of a very specific set of standards that I'm going to get into. And I also want to answer your question that you wrote in about, which is what would it take for me to become a Christian? Because I think that is extremely important. And before the show, you and I talked and you said you were going to actually join us on the Patreon forum, which I very much appreciate. So under this episode, you're going to be able to, to message with people and respond to them and some of their concerns. Um, and I mean, look, you're a, you're a missionary. This is what you do. You know, you're on a mission to, um, to, to change, change lives and to change, you know, people's faith. Uh, so you're going to have a solid, you know, group of 800 people. I would say 65 to 70% of which are atheists, um, to sort of hash out some of these, some of these things. And so I certainly appreciate you talking to me about these. So let's do that. Um, well, we're that, we're several hours ahead, so if there there might be a delay in responses to. Yeah, I know. What what, what is it for you now? Like, let's see. I'm guessing. What is it like? Four thirty in the morning. I Man, we're kind of pretty close. Yeah, four thirty. So wow. the sun will be up soon. Wow. All right. But, but that's no problem. I'm 
I'm, I'm, I'm enjoying this. Uh, yeah, me too. Me too. Okay, so let's do that. Let's talk about what it would take for me to be a Christian. Let's talk about um, morality from an atheistic perspective. Uh, let's do that. The conversation continues at patreon.com slash David C. Smalley. Everybody else, please drive like you know each other. <laughs> 